year let's let's hope uh, that uh, this year uh, is a more pleasant one and we are able to <laughs> handle the covid 19 pandemic much more effectively and get rid of it hopefully uh, talking of the pandemic, you will kindly recall that in January 21, we had uh, held our first talk that was delivered by Dr. Chinmay Tumbe also on pandemics. And uh, in a way, this pandemic is revenge of nature. Uh, this is in a way a very unprecedented challenge. I don't think we have faced anything like this in last 100 years. But climate change is a, a much more daunting challenge. It will affect everyone. We are already seeing its effect, the wildfires, the <clears throat> uh, ice melting, uh, oceans rising, flooding, extreme weather events, <clears throat> north, all kinds of things. But somehow uh, we are not taking notice of it or we don't quite realize uh, that this is not a climate change event, it's really a climate emergency. It's a catastrophe which we will inevitably face if we don't take any action. And it's a great uh, honor for us. It's, it's, we are really privileged to have you, Dr. Narayan, to talk on the subject. Um, may I now request our president, Mr. Arun Kumar, to formally introduce you and uh, begin proceedings today. Arun Kumar. Thank you, Thank you Narayan. Friends, it is my pleasure today to welcome a very distinguished person, Sunita Narayanji, to Jigyasa Forum of our association. We all know her as an eminent environmentalist, particularly for studying relationship between environment and development. She has expressed her pro-poor environmental concerns in various books and articles written by her. She firmly believes that sustainable development is not possible without inclusive and equitable growth. She has directed campaigns on air pollution control, community water management, pesticide regulation, just to name a few. Her other fields of research are the link between local democracy and global democracy and climate change. Sumitra Narayanji has numerous publications to her credit. In 1991, she co-authored Global Warming in an Unequal World, a case of environmental colonialism, which played a critical role in establishing the principle of equity in the Framework Convention on Climate Change. She is the editor of the widely read magazine, Down to Earth. Her latest book, Conflict of Interests, outlines the environmental challenges that India faces and presents a blueprint for dealing with exigencies of climate change and environmental degradation. <clears throat> for her lifelong and distinguished work in this area, she was awarded the Padam Shri in 2005. She was awarded the Stockholm Water Prize in 2005 and the Albert II of Monaco Foundation Award for her work to build a water literate society. In 2016, Time Magazine featured her as one of the 100 most influential people in the world for her advocacy of poor and environment and climate change. Sunita so Narayanji received the Order of the Polar Star Award from the Swedish government in 2017. Sunita so Narayanji working as the Director General of the New Delhi-based Center for Science and Environment. The center received the Indira Gandhi Prize for Peace, Disarmament, and Development for 2018. Sunita Narayanji was also actively involved in the recently held Glasgow Conference on Climate Change. Friends, Earth's climate has changed several times before, even when man was not there. 
there are other strong natural forces which affect earth's climate whatever we do or not do climate change seems to be inevitable it is high time that we start preparing for facing the consequences of climate change sunita narayan ji is an expert on this subject and we are eagerly looking forward to hear her sunita narayan ji you are welcome now thank you arun ji thank you narendra ji and thank you so much for asking me uh today to speak to all of you i'm i'm really honored uh to be in your company and um uh, narendra ji if i could get uh, i will share my screen and show my presentation what's so, certain uh, what's that yes um so that uh, sorry wait a minute um so i overheard the conversation before and uh, you know it's often said that it's becoming so cold so where is climate change and i also overheard very correctly i think it was narendra ji or arun ji i i don't know who said it but i think the fact was that it was very very uh, correctly said that climate change is about extremes it's not about um, whether it's i mean i think we have also uh, fallen into a trap to call it global warming because it it tends to make you feel that it, the world is going to just become warmer no climate change is really about that uh, huge existential threat that the world faces today because we will see extreme weather events which will have massive massive impacts on um on our countries so this is really what i wanted to discuss today with you um um the fact is climate change is real and every year till the next year comes around um is the warmest year um and if you look at this uh, chart you will see that there is global mean temperature difference is very clear there is also enough evidence to show that this is anthropogenic causes that this is not about the natural variations that you would expect to find in the world that we have around us and often it is it is it has to be understood that we are living therefore in the age of the anthropocene this is an age when human beings are having such extraordinary impact that they're literally changing the world's climate and this is not something that we need to take lightly in 2021 the un secretary general essentially pointed to and said that this is a code red for humanity uh he said very clearly and there is enough evidence that the temperature rise is today over 1 degree centigrade 1.1 degree centigrade um and we are now getting to a point where we will be hitting what is today called the guardrail it's a safety net 1.5 degree centigrade rise from the pre industrial era of 1870 to now and we need to understand that if at 1.1 or 1.2 degree centigrade rise we are already seeing these incredibly horrendous impacts across the world then at 1.5 we are talking about things spiraling out of control and the fact is the scale of transition the transformation that we need is huge because all data shows that we need to reduce global greenhouse emissions by 45% over 2010 level by 2030 and we need to reach net zero by 2050 now this becomes even more difficult and you know for us to and i think for us in india we need to make this position clear to the rest of the world that the most inconvenient truth in climate change is not that the world needs to reduce emissions but it also needs to share emissions between the rich and the poor because large numbers of people in the world have still not got the right to development and we know today that the emissions of greenhouse gases are linked to economic growth as we know it which means that the world is literally talking about sharing that growth not just between nations but between people 
at Down to Earth and at CSC, we're always tracking these extreme weather events just to give an idea of, you know, the scale that is happening because often we don't tend to understand just how dramatic the scale is and how much it is affecting us. And if you look at this, we just for a short period between January to July, all these dots show you the number of disaster events that happened just last year in six months. We have now completed it and we have now putting together the full year's data and you will just see the whole earth, the whole world is full of these red dots showing you the extreme um, events that are happening between drought, storms, extreme temperature, landslides, floods, wildfires, glacial lake outbursts. And of course, they have a huge economic cost as well. So another data we put together on the number of events happening across the world. But the point I want to make is that today science can actually attribute these extreme weather events to climate change. And this is very important for us to understand because often there is a great sense that there's always been a climate change that happens. There's always been weather variability. So what is it? Why are we talking about the link to human induced climate change? And I want to keep emphasizing this is human induced. It's anthropogenic because it is what we have emitted in the atmosphere, which has resulted in the um, in temperatures to rise, which in turn is having these horrendous impacts. So today, scientists have this science, I mean, world scientists can today do what they call attribution. And between 2003 to 2021, they found human fingerprints in almost 80% of the extreme weather events that happened in the world. So today you can put, you can find that fingerprint of what is the result of climate change. It's no longer just an extreme rain event. It, it is induced by climate change. Now, if you look at India, we are extremely vulnerable. And if you look at the factors that make vulnerability, you essentially find that there are extreme vulnerable states and then there are low and moderate. Now, I really believe that this science is something that is emerging, that it is difficult for us to say what in India is high vulnerability and low vulnerability. I believe it is really about the poor in India and the poor across India are equally vulnerable. In fact, increasingly vulnerable. Because in 2021, extreme weather events affected 3.8 million people. And the total cost of the damages was put down to 50,000 crore. So, you know, all of you have been, and this is why it's such a privilege to talk to you. You have all been in the business of creating development, of doing development. Now, what climate change is doing is to destroy the development dividend. Every time there is such a disaster, you have to, un we, we know that what it takes away is the hard earned effort to build society, to build schools, to build uh, rural infrastructure, to build toilets, to build uh, uh, public health infrastructure, and to essentially build the well being of people uh, through uh, rural assets. So people get pushed back every time there is such an event. The fact is that even as climate change is happening, the one thing that we in the world that the world refuses to understand and accept. And this is why voices from the South, voices that are loud and powerful from the South are needed to ensure that the world understands the imperative of equity in the talk about urgent and bold action. And why is this important? Because of the science of climate change. These gases are different from the gases when I talk about local air pollution and I talk about Delhi, Delhi's uh, air pollution, the residence time of that gas, that particulate matter in the air is just 24 hours, maybe 48 hours if you have fog because they trap the particulates. But otherwise, if those emissions 
have a very small residence time. The problem with climate change is the fact that the gases that create climate change, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, have a very long residence time in the atmosphere, over 150 years when it comes to carbon dioxide, which means that what was emitted in 1800 or 1870 is still in the atmosphere. So you cannot say that what a country like the United States did to, for its growth and for the emissions that were created because of its growth can be forgotten. Because those emissions are still in the atmosphere. And this is why climate change is, a, is very clear that you cannot wipe out the past that historical emissions matter, that the cumulative emissions over the years matter. The second is that the emissions which lead to climate change come out of burning fossil fuel, 70% of them. They're related to the energy system that we know it. They're related to economic growth as the world knows it today. Which is why when you're talking about climate negotiations, you're not talking about negotiating about ecology. You're talking about negotiating about economic space. You know, we've often relegated climate negotiations to the back burner. And most people say WTO negotiations are more important. Actually, climate change negotiations are really much more important because they're about negotiating for that economic space, the right to development, and the way that the world will share the economic space as we know it. Now, what is also very clear is that the, the carbon budget, the budget that is available to the world uh, to stay below a particular temperature threshold is already over. And yet the poor countries will need to grow. Countries like India will need to grow. And we will add to the emissions in the atmosphere which is why the principle of equity is not a moral question in climate change. It is really a question of the imperative. If you look at this, this is a new booklet that we did for Glasgow, where we put together all the information about why equity uh, is so important in climate negotiations. So if you look at this, this is really the, um, the large polluters, the seven big polluters. Then you have China, which is increasingly taken up the space. The green is India. Now, this is the, this, the, this is the emissions and the rise of the emissions from 1870 to now. And you can see how China's growth has become big from the time it joined WTO in 2005. And this is really the data that shows very clearly that since 2000, China has become the foremost polluter. 28% of the emissions are today from China. And India still is about 7%. And um, the rest, the, what I call the historical polluters, still occupy a large space. Now, this is not enough. The fact is that, as I said, there is a budget. And the budget is a very simple science. We have a temperature rise, 1.5 degrees. We know now how much carbon dioxide can be emitted before we reach that 1.5 degree threshold. So that's the budget. Now, if you look at the budget, between 1870 to 2019, these seven large polluters of the world have appropriated this budget. If you look at this, this is China, this is India, and this is the rest of the world. Now, if you look at this, which is from 1870 to 2030, China will take up 16, 17% in addition. India's share of the budget from 1870 to 2030 will still be 4%. So this is really where the world is today. It has run out of the carbon budget. By 2030, the budget will be over. Yet vast numbers of people, 24%, this blue space here is where Africa is, where the huge, where the full continent of Africa is. Now, this is really where the crisis of climate change has to be understood, that we have vast numbers of the world's people who still need the right to development, and yet the world has run out of the 
the, the space, the atmospheric space to, to take these emissions any further. And the poor we know are the victims of climate change. They have not contributed to the stock of emissions. Now, this is something that we really need to emphasize and understand from our perspective, because India is a victim of climate change. We are seeing the impacts of climate change. We also need to act on climate change, and I will come to that subsequently. But the fact is, we know that this climate change is happening at the worst time in human history. The world is worried about COVID, it's worried about all sorts of skirmishes, Ukraine, this, that, and the other is happening. Nobody has time for climate change. Yet, we are seeing the worst impacts today. And the future, therefore, is here. I wanted to, as all of you are based in Rajasthan, I mean, have worked in Rajasthan, you know your state very well. I wanted to talk about this one experience that we had when we were you know, uh, two years ago in 2020, all of us were worried about how at one time, at, on one hand from Wuhan, we were getting the news of the COVID um, virus. But on the other hand, we were all glued to images in our TV of the wildfires in Australia. Yet what was happening in our own backyard, we did not focus on. And this was the huge locust invasion that was happening in Rajasthan, and in Gujarat in that period. Now, why did the locust invasion happen even in the past? But the virulence of this was something that we needed to understand. Why did this happen in 2020? What was the cause of it? And the cause of it was really about the fact that because of the unseasonable, unseasonal variable weather events, there was the right conditions created for locusts to multiply. And you know, this tidda is something that multiplies exponentially. So it got the right conditions of rain in the desert, vegetation, and higher temperatures for its movement. If you look at this, it actually started in 2018, 2019, when there was unusual weather events in the Arabian Peninsula. Cyclones that hit the Arabian Peninsula, which are today now linked to the, uh, the impacts of climate change. And their lakes were formed in the desert in the Arabian Peninsula and the locusts found the right breeding conditions. We then found this movement of locusts down to the Horn of Africa and across Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and into India. And again, it was very much to do with the fact that how you had prolonged rainfall during this period, even in Rajasthan, the monsoon did not retreat. When it was to retreat, vegetation was very rich and you saw a huge explosion of these uh, creatures. In fact, the FAO came very close to calling it a locust famine because you know that when locusts take over, they actually destroy everything. And it was in Africa that they essentially found that they could, they're very close to calling it a famine. Now, this is really what we have to understand is we often don't see the impact of climate change because we, we don't see the fingerprint of climate change in an event that we would think is normal. And yet, we, we, we knew that with this movement that you could see, the unusual events, the long prolonged monsoon, the growth of this insect, and therefore the impact on farmers and the poor in, in, in these regions. Down to earth, CSC did, we did a lot of work at that time, sent out our reporters, brought back the news, looked at these events, involved WFAO, called off called on the government to essentially say, we need to act now because this will be devastating for the farmers of that region. The other impact that we are now seeing more and more, and we all live here, so we know that we are seeing this impact and we will see more of it, is extreme rain events. Now, India is an unusual monsoon country, um, but what you will see now because of uh, um, uh, climate change and the 
and the warming in the atmosphere is that you will see more extreme rain events happening. Now, this, this information is uh, from WMO, which shows very clearly which are the countries where you will see these wide variations in precipitation. Now, this will also mean that you will get more season, uh, more less rainfall events and more rainfall events. So variations will grow. When we've tracked it, we, you will see here in 2019, look at the kind of extreme rain events that happened. Now, for all of us, we know that the true finance minister of India is the monsoon. We also know that we have already got a uh, country where it rains for only a hundred hours in a year. We have survived and built a civilization based on very little amounts of rainy days. What you will see now is even fewer number of rainy days and more rainfall. If you look at this data, this is for this year. We put together all the normal rainfall and the excess rainfall events and the very heavy rainfall events. Look at the dots in this, how much the extreme rainfall events are happening. So what you will see is more rain in fewer number of rainy days. And the challenge for us will be even more our ability to be able to hold the water and to use it in prolonged drought, dry periods. We literally are going to see what is called flood at the time of drought because we will not have the ability to hold the water, it will lead to floods and then it will lead to droughts. And this is the double whammy that we will suffer from. So it is not as if it's only climate change because it's also about our mismanagement of our own resources, of our own land and water resources, of our inability to be able to build and protect the catchments of our water system, to be able to not willfully destroy the lakes and tanks and ponds of our cities, of our villages. But in the, what climate change will do is to exacerbate that, will make it much worse. And this is something that we have to understand. Therefore, the need to accelerate development at scale and pace we have never seen. And this is really also about the third impact, which is rising heat. Every year gets hotter. Now we know today that rising heat means that it will lead to water stress. It will dry the moisture in our soils, increase the need for irrigation, therefore increase the need for what is already scarce water because of our inability to be able to hold it. It will increase evaporation rates. It will drive up the use of water from drinking to irrigation. And we know that the fight between water, between the existing users of water, which is agriculture, and the new users of water, which are industry and and cities is already leading to tensions in our countries. So water management will obviously be critical in the age of climate change. But as I was saying, this is really about a double whammy. You know, I want to say this and stress on this because I often find today, what is also happening is that climate change is becoming a very nice bogey for everything that goes wrong. I, you know, I see, floods in, um, in uh, Mumbai, and then the chief minister says, what can I do with the climate change? I see um, you know, um, a landslide in, the, in, in, um, in Himalayas, and everyone says, hey, the climate change. Vese bhi Indians are so fatalistic. And then it happens, it not climate change. It is not. We need to understand that climate change will exacerbate the impacts. If you look at the dams in the Himalayas, if you look at the Himalayas and the kind of vulnerability of the Himalayas, climate change has exacerbated the impacts. The floods in the recent dam burst in the Himalayas is a result of our mismanagement. I was on a planning commission committee head, headed by BK Chaturvedi to look at the dams, the hydroelectric projects in the Himalayas. Now, I am in favor of hydroelectricity. I believe hydroelectricity is one of the most benign forms of energy. It's also one of the advantages that the Himalayas have. It's a raw material of the Himalayas, water and energy. But the way in which those projects were planned in the Himalayas along the Ganga Basin was ridiculous. 
You have engineers planned uh, working to re-engineer the, the Ganga. You have engineers building dams as if they were building a car park in GK2. Bumper to bumper to bumper. Now, this is what we are getting to where we are looking and then we turn around and say, this is a conflict between environment and development. No, it's a conflict between senseless development and environment. And this is something that we have to understand and not fall into this trap of the conflict between environment and development. So it's important for us to understand that climate change will exacerbate the impacts. It is not going to be the only reason why we will see more floods, more droughts, more landslides in our countries. But the most important thing is that we know that all these are not single day events. They will cripple lives, livelihoods, take away, as I said, the development dividend, and we will see more migration as people find it more and more difficult to cope with this. We already have an agrarian distress in our country. We already have poverty and marginalization, and all this only will make sure it's like the last straw on the camel's back. Now, this is important because, you know, I keep getting asked that what is happening? Are we seeing migration? Now, we've, in our cities, we see cities growing in the illegal. We see more and more unauthorized construction because people are moving. But all the data that we have in India is always 10 years out of date. Census comes of 2001. By the time the census comes out, India has already changed. So we really don't know and track the developments that are happening in front of us. Yet today, you have people now telling us very clearly that what you will see is internal displacement will overtake the impacts of what is called traditional displacement, conflict and war. If you look at this chart, you will see that actually more displacement is happening because of floods, droughts, and other reasons, not just about the traditional displacement of war and conflict. So what then does India do? And this is important because we know climate change is happening. We know that the world has run out of space. We also know that we are not, the, we may be the third largest polluter, but we know that the quantum of our pollution is way below what China or the US, which are the first and second polluters um, uh, emit. And we also know, as I just told you, that the world has run out of carbon budget. But we are also victims of climate change. So in my view, India must continue to put pressure on the rest of the world to act, must continue to push the issues of equity globally, but we need to act in our own self-interest. And we need to design our climate change strategy as a co-benefit strategy. It is, it is a strategy that we must develop, which is good for our own development, for our own environment, and therefore good for climate change. So if you look at this, what must we do? Number one, obviously we must meet the 450 gigawatt 2030 renewable target. Actually, the prime minister in his Glasgow speech has now upped the target to 750 or 700 gigawatt. But for me, the renewable story is not about just investing in large scale renewable. It is about access to clean energy for the poorest in our country. So we have to design our energy strategy for clean energy access for the poorest. You know, as well as I do, that in spite of all our talk about electrification in this country, the grid may have reached, but electricity has not, because people are too poor to still pay for that electricity. So it's going to be critical for us to redesign our clean energy strategy for the core benefit of energy access as well. Two, we must invest in our ability to be able to forecast disasters. I mean, I keep asking, um, especially when I'm speaking to uh, young people in India, I keep asking, you know, can you name 
a rocket scientist of India. And everybody's hands goes up and they all name a rocket scientist. And then I ask, can you name a meteorological scientist in India? And not a single person's hand goes up. Yet today, meteorological science is going to determine India's future much more than rocket science. And this is something that is critical for us to understand and give the respect to that science so that we can actually build much more uh, ability of our country to forecast these disasters. Third, we must build the resilience of communities through augmented work in water conservation and local livelihood support. And of course, today, the most important challenge is going to be what is called the ability of the world to be able to sequester the carbon dioxide emissions. And that will come out of the tree wealth that we have. But as much as the world is talking about growing trees, we in India must talk about growing trees in a way that they can become livelihoods of people. India must redesign its tree strategy so that it can work for the poor communities who live in its habitats. Many years ago, um, when Dr. Manmohan Singh was the prime minister and Sariska lost its uh, last tiger, he asked me to chair what is now called, what is called the Tiger Task Force. And I, I looked and, you know, when I presented the report to him, I showed him a map and I said, the tragedy of India is that India's tigers live where its forests are. And its forests are where its watershed is. And yet these are the same regions where the poorest of India live. These are the same regions where Naxalism is growing, where unrest is growing. So if you look at this, you need to design a conservation strategy in which you design it for, for coexistence. You design it so that communities benefit from it. Now there was, acceptance of my report, um, a lot was done post my report, but still I believe the agenda of coexistence is something that has been difficult to implement. There is too much resistance against it. And that is an area that India will have to do a lot more work if it needs to develop a strategy of co-benefits where people benefit and the environment benefits. Now, it's also very clear that we need a decarbonization agenda, again, for our own benefits. We have a huge problem of air pollution. We have a huge problem of the use of coal and the mining of coal where our forests are. And the most important problem that I am faced today when I was a member of the Supreme Court uh, Committee, the Burilal Committee, and we were, we were essentially arguing that whether it is in Rajasthan, whether it is in uh, Delhi, that we have to get out of the use of burning coal in small boilers across the country. Massive energy impacts. Yet industry says there is no option because electricity is expensive. It makes production uncompetitive. Natural gas is not under GST. It is too expensive. And thermal power plants, in addition, remain extremely polluting. One third of India's emissions come from thermal power plants. 50% of the fuel related CO2 emissions come from our energy production. So India will have to confront the issue of coal. We will have to confront the issue of coal in our own self-interest, not just in the interest of the global community. Today, unfortunately, and this is something that has been a struggle and we have lost this fight for the moment, you know, we don't give up, so we will continue fighting. Uh, the fact is that we have massive numbers of old plants and we had argued for a strong emission control on thermal power plants. Today, the Ministry of Environment has come up with a penalty system where the penalty is lower than the cost of installing the emission control system. So essentially you're giving plants a license to pollute. Now, this is, this is where we are not walking the talk. And we will have to walk the talk in our own interest, in my view. And this is really where the air pollution challenge in our cities is very critical. We are finding that air pollution is a growing problem. It has a huge health burden. 
uh, something that we cannot ignore anymore, something that is in our face, in our lungs, in our children's health. So it's not something that we cannot uh, uh, work on. In Delhi, with the pollution going up, I can only say that a lot has been done. If you look at this, we have we have leapfrogged in uh, emission control. We have dis disincentivized diesel vehicles. In Delhi, we have also got an um, environment tax on trucks coming in. We have built the Eastern and Western Peripheral Expressway. We have banned the use of coal in Delhi. Um, pet coke has been banned across the region, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of work that uh, uh, the committee that I was in as the Supreme Court mandated committee, the Burilal committee, we took it to the Supreme Court and a lot of things that we got done through that. And we found that the curve is bending, but the point I want to make to you is that it's not enough. And this is really where we need to understand the scale of the transformation. And I'm saying this to you because you're, you have been, a, you have the experience of governance and you know that in India, that if you take small steps, that it just gets eaten up at the scale of the change that happens. And this is really when you talk about the world, we have a microcosm in India that unless we do things at scale and pace, we will never be able to see the actual benefits of it. And this is really where we are arguing that in India, if in Delhi, if we want to have clean air, then we will have to see what we call a mobility transformation and a fuel use transformation. And a mobility transformation cannot be one bus here and one bus there, our chief minister saying, oh, I brought one electric bus and somebody else saying, oh, we brought five buses back into our city. We literally have to talk about reinventing mobility so that we can move people and not vehicles. We have to integrate our public transport system in a way that people can walk, they can cycle, they can take a metro, they can take a bus. And and remember the challenge in India is, and this is the most difficult challenge is, that our transport system has to be affordable for the poor and yet modern, safe and convenient enough for the rich. And when I talk about the poor, the bulk of Indian cities, based on even a recent survey by the Ministry of Urban Development, the bulk of Indian cities, people walk, they cycle because they are too poor to even take a bus. And the bus ticket is normally pegged at one rupee a kilometer. So you are talking about actually making public transport so affordable that even the poor who can't afford a bus can take it. And that also goes for the whole question about the clean fuel transition. Because today, our cities, our industries use dirty fuel because, the, because coal is cheapest. And yet we do need to find ways in which we can actually move industries to cleaner fuel. Now, whether it is gas or whether it is electricity, we definitely need to find ways in which we can move out of these thousands of small boilers, thousands of industrial stacks. And the only reason why industries depend on it is because the public systems have become so difficult to access and so unreliable. And I keep saying this, uh, that India is one of the most interesting countries where we take the cheapest fuel, coal, which we can get energy out of, electricity out of, electricity generation at one rupee 50 pesa per unit. And when we supply it to people, it is seven rupees to nine rupees a unit, the most expensive energy. So we have to understand the, the, the huge inefficiencies that we have built into the system where you are essentially finding just like bottled water, the biggest crisis today is that the rich are opting out of the systems and they are the ones, whether it's the rich or the industries are opting out of the systems. And this decentralized use of energy is actually leading to more and more pollution. But the most important thing for us to understand is that all this, just like climate change, air pollution is a great equalizer. 
The fact is, and I keep getting asked this question in Delhi, which air purifier to buy? And I keep saying, buy whichever air purifier you want, you will still have to breathe. Now, this is slightly different from water pollution. The fact is our rivers are dead. Our rivers are completely dead. Yamuna is today a, a dead river because this dissolved oxygen level is zero. Yamuna when, when it flows through Delhi. But we don't care because we have moved to bottled water. The, uh, the, 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 the distribution agencies uh, clean the water and they supply it to us. For us, the death of a river is, 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 is esoteric. But the fact is that when it comes to air, it's very different. You will have to breathe. And rich, poor, it doesn't matter. But the other thing is that the air shed has no boundaries. And if the, poor, if the rich contribute to it through their SUVs, diesel SUVs, the poor will contribute because they don't have access to clean energy. And this is the survival versus luxury emissions. But the only way you can clean up the air is if the poor have access to inclusive growth, which is why for me, when I talk about this, and I, it's not something that inclusive growth comes after growth. Sustainability is not possible unless that growth is equitable, unless that growth is inclusive. Same thing with mobility, same thing with climate change, same thing with air pollution. So as I wrap up very quickly, how then is the future? And the big issues for us, I think in the world, not just in India are going to be, what is then going to be the future of production in all this? We have till now built economies by discounting labor and environment. When I look at air pollution in, in Delhi, most of it today is coming out of the illegal industrial areas across the city. Now, why do those industrial areas exist? Because the cost of regulation does not exist there. And therefore, people can discount uh, the cost of environment. A few years ago, the High Court gave me a task to look at uh, 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 the problem of water pollution in one of the outlying areas, uh, the unauthorized uh, colonies of Delhi called Shiv Vihar. And I went there and there was a lot because it's High Court, there was a lot, the factory had been closed down, they were basically dying genes and the blue color was polluting the water. But, you know, I looked down and I found blue color and uh, even though all the factories had been closed. So I said, but pani to nila hai. So we tracked back the nala jaha tha. And, you know, it, as in India, as it happens in India, you know, not surprising at all. One part of the building's door opened in Delhi, the other part of the building's door opened in UP. So the factory guy just simply closed the door that opened to Delhi and opened the door that opened to UP. Uh, UP may, I mean, but the fact is, why were the people doing this? Because, you know, we all wear jeans, but we don't want to pay the cost of the pollution control. And the cost of pollution control is regulatory control as well, which is very high transaction cost. So everybody moves to where there is no control. So you can call these the new republics of India, but this is clearly where there is no regulatory control. There is no hand of government that works over here but they happen because we discount labor and environment conditions in needing to find goods and places for production, which are cheaper. Now, can this be reversed? Can we end up with paying higher cost of consumption um, of our consumption? And can we basically make sure that we can, can we do this across the world? Because if, if I talk about Shiv Vihar, they will say, if you increase our cost, then people will just move to Rajasthan. Or if Rajasthan mein, agar aapne bhiwadi mein band kar diya, to koi bhiwadi ke gaon mein khol denge. Or agar aapne bhiwadi ke gaon mein band kar diya, to wo thoda dur ja ke khol denge. So I think we are really talking about. We need to understand the structural problem because of which a lot of this is happening, and this is why we need to argue for what I keep saying: this paradigm shift in the way we do development where we have to focus on rural resilience. I mean, to me, the Manrega program, something that we have been one of the loudest voices for Manrega, 
but not as an employment generation program, not as a rights program, but as an asset creation program, as a program that invests in rural assets. It's been very difficult to fight for because even now when you look at it, um, most of the assets that get created under Manrega are not created for sustainability. They're created for one season because we are not create, we are not visualizing Manrega as the world's largest adaptation program, as the world's largest livelihood support program. Second, of course, is to focus on local production and nature-based solutions that we are talking about. But here we also need to focus then on affordable and sustainable urban industrial growth, what I have talked about, and focus on health as a preventive agenda for all. I mean, one of the most interesting things that the government of India did in the last budget was to include water in its health uh, budget line. And I think that's a huge progress because we are beginning to see the role of water as a preventive action that without the access to clean water that we cannot have uh, health for all. And this is really where we also need to relook at the paradigm of land and forest management. We have moved from conservation, from, we have moved from extraction to conservation. We need to find a way in which, as I keep saying that map of India, where the forests of India are, where the poor of India live, we need to be able to find a conservation paradigm in which we can use forest resources for development. We also need to relook at our agricultural strategy because till now we have had a high input agriculture, which adds to risk. And in climate change, in the times of climate change, it adds to therefore the indebtedness. We are just doing a review in Down to Earth of the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bhima Yojana. And it is shocking to see how little benefits have gone to farmers and how it has actually benefited companies and not farmers. So we need to be able to find ways in which we can replan these schemes, but we also need to find ways in which we don't make people poorer. But finally, the very clear message of climate change is that the world needs inclusive growth. Today, we have a deadly race between the virus, the vaccine, and the variant. We know that. I mean, Delta happened, today Omicron is happening. Yes, vast parts of Africa remain unvaccinated. We talk very glibly about the fact that nobody is safe till all are safe. And yet we know that unless we invest in vaccines for all, public health for all, we will not be able to secure the future of the rich. It's the same with climate change. We live in an interdependent world which requires global cooperation and sustainability both in India as well as the world is not possible without affordable and inclusive growth for all. This is not something which are words, but that's something that we need to put into action more and more. I mean, today the world has run out of time. We don't need just to walk the talk. We actually need to run the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sunita Ji, for the wonderful presentation. Particularly, you have highlighted what is required to be done. That is more important. We all, all know what is happening, but what we should do, that is most important. So you have very rightly highlighted it. There may be some comments or questions. Of course. Yes, yeah. Dr. Narayan, can I uh, request you for a question? <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Narayan. Uh, first of all, compliments for a very sustainable presentation. Thank you. Sustainable because it will sustain with us. You can be rest assured. <laughs> Uh, you very elaborately talked of uh, various factors involved. I just want to touch a small one. Uh, our Prime Minister, as you repeated, has said that we will increase the renewable uh, energy production by 50% and reduce our dependence on coal. A very laudable thing to be done, and that he has you know, increased the coal to energy. What should be done? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Uh, that is a very laudable thing to be done. Yes. And surely, if that happens, 
uh, the production will be about uh, about two rupees a unit, uh, which will come down massively from the coal, mm -hmm. and I think we'll save a lot of coal also. But as you rightly uh, uh, covered, even if we even if you you know uh, are able to produce that much of renewable energy and meet the energy demand through that better source, which is a non polluting source, uh, what about the transmission? Will we be able to transmit at a cheaper cost? Which you are yourself said. What is produced at 1 rupee 1.5 is given to us in Jaipur at 9 rupees. Now, how will you tackle that? And is the government scheme, which you know better than all of us retired people will know it today, are we catering to infrastructure changes, changes in the transmission lines, changes in the grid system, which can deliver it at a much cheaper rate than what is being today? And if that is not so, then I think we are only changing the source of energy rather than supply to the poor people, or uh, even to us in the, in the uh, cities. That, to my mind, will not really bring the change that you are looking forward to. Thank you. Should I answer that? Yeah, please. No, I agree with you, Mr. Sharma. In fact, it's very clear that we are focusing too much on the hardware of generation and not enough on the so software of distribution. I mean, um, <clears throat> and uh, maybe one day we can invite all of you so we have a campus in Rajasthan now, CSE. It's in Tijara, uh, which is um, uh, close to Albar. A beautiful campus we have made, a, cap a training campus um, over there. Now I am doing, uh, we are putting a rooftop solar uh, project there uh, in our campus. We've already done rainwater harvesting. We're completely uh, recycle all our sewage waste. We, so everything else has been done. The final picture is to do become um, um, totally dependent on the energy that we generate. Now, Sharmati, the problem I'm having today is well, we'll put up a rooftop solar, but we will make sure we will, in fact, um, uh, create more problems for the discount because today, if you look at it, CSE's project campus in Tijara is probably out of, you know, Tijara has one or two only other commercial or large establishments. So we are the only paying customers for the discount. And if we today now generate our own, we will generate our own uh, solar energy and we will actually be selling energy to the discom. Uh, what happens to the health of the discom going further? Now, I think we need to address this issue and I'm not an energy expert. I'll be very frank with you. There are many more people who have spent too much more time looking at Discom Health and to look at, you know, all the government program, 90,000 crore is being pumped into the Discoms today. I can't tell you whether it's good, bad, ki galat hai. I only know as an environmentalist, I'm tired of the government um, energy experts telling me, ki Madam, coal ke sabhai India ke paas koi option nahi hai. Because I keep telling them, sir, coal you are using so cheap energy, so expensive So what is the point? I mean, you have to invest and have to repair your energy infrastructure. And today, just like it's happened with bottled water, just like it's happened with every other thing, if the rich opt out of the public system, the public systems will become even more disabled. So you're absolutely right. Your point is very valid, but quite honestly, I'm not the right person. There are many more better people than me who have worked on discoms and energy. I'm an environmentalist whose essential job has been to push the government to say, you cannot keep depending on dirty energy and tell me that there is no option going forward. Thank you, Sanataji, for your invitation to come to Tijara. Uh, I spent a very little time in uh, uh, energy, but in the in the 55 people that are listening to you, I know there are 10 experts on energy who have spent their time. Uh, please give us a date. We would like to come. We will use our own transport and have a picnic there at your cost. No problem. We would love to host you. It's an absolutely glorious uh, and we will uh, And we will learn a lot. Uh, what you said about solar is absolutely correct. I have a plant. Uh, I keep uh, supplying to Discom uh, and get one rupee as a discount, which is Pittance, but I, I I worked it out in a way that I do not generate more than my requirement because I know uh, there is no point giving to discount. I better use it uh, myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, may I, sir? Um, one is uh, about what, as uh, senior citizens, although we are kind of remote from this uh, challenge or this uh, likely catastrophe, it's really um, our children and grandchildren which will really face the heat. But in their interest, we should do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering whether, as a group of senior citizens, can we put pressure on local authorities in some way or can we take some action which might uh, help uh, the local communities? Is there any scope for local action in terms of uh, creating awareness, in terms of uh, generating public pressure to change policies which impact uh, communities and urban development? And also, uh, similarly, at the national level, although <clears throat> uh, a lot of good announcements have been made at COP26 from the side of the Indian government. But in terms of action, every day one keeps reading about uh, relaxation in uh, environmental regulation in order to develop, in order to promote development. Therefore, the actual uh, problem is that uh, the challenge of climate change does not have enough political focus. There is not enough pressure at the national level. Of course, not at the international level, but even at the national level. So is there something that can be done to uh, coerce governments into taking action which is uh, much more uh, effective than what is happening today? So basically, what is possible at the local level, which individuals like us can take up together as a community and what can be done to put greater pressure at the national level. So Narendra ji, I think a lot, you know, I am a great believer in democracy. I mean, we've all worked in India's democracy. We, India's democracy is still one of our biggest strengths and democracy means that there is a space for dialogue there is a space for dissent. There is a space also for learning. Now, I think the biggest role that you're, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I just think that with all your combined wisdom and your combined, you have huge respect in society. A lot of these ideas really need people to stand behind them sometimes. They just require people to say, ye karna chahiye, ye important hai. Or, ye al ye differently karna chahiye. The biggest challenge that we are having today is the inability to think differently, the courage to act differently. And uh, I mean, whether it is about, uh, I mean, many mobility ke baare mein aap se to diya, magar ab aap, agar kisi city planner se kahenge ki, I want a city jaha par log uh, gaadi nahi le, le, unko gaadi le, leni ki jarwat nahi padhe. You will find, ha, madam, ye kehna bada asane, maga karna bada mushkil hai. At the end of the day, we need to invest in roads. And hum log to sadak maha tak le jayenge, jahaan pa logon ke liye jage bhi nahi ho, chalne ke liye. Or, um, and also, I think it's a lot to do with just standing behind some of these ideas in my view. And that's what I have found is most important in the work we do. Um, you know, we have to... I, I, I do a lot of work on shit, sewage. My biggest passion is to work on um, excreta. I did a book called Excreta Management many years ago. We work on what we call shit flow diagrams now. You know, for seven years, it took us to basically get people to understand that how much of India is unconnected to our sewage systems. How much of India really needs to be connected to what you would call off-site systems. Today, the idea of fecal sludge management is understood. But how do you operate it? What do you do? New knowledge needs to be generated. New ideas need to come in. So I think, in my view, the openness, the ability to be able to stand behind what seems to be an idea which is not possible to do is the most important challenge today. And that's whether it's at the local level or whether it is at the national level. I think both areas, that's really where it is. And finally, I think, you know, whether it is, you know, the dilution of environmental standards that you hear about and all the rest, 
I think there's a huge false narrative that has been created over the years of two things. One, ki development or environment ke beech mein sangharsh hai. And that projects are being held up and that projects don't get cleared and that, you know, all the rest of it. Agar aap dekhi, all data showing you projects so clear ho hi jate hain kyunki faceless committees sit, whether it at the central level or the state level, the state environmental impact assessment committee sit, kal clear kar dete hain, uske andar hazaar conditions bana dete hain, conditions kaun janta hai ki wo conditions kabhi implement ho sakti hain, ki nahi ho sakti hain. We have created a system which is basically reeks of corruption, of, of, um, of a system which is not designed for environmental integrity. And yet we call it an environmental regulation system. For the last 10 years, I have been arguing with, with in fact, more now, because even in the, more in the UPA government, I argued again and again and again, saying that you reform it, brother. These environmental systems, hai, they're not designed for environment. They're designed for corruption. मगर किसी का इंटरेस्ट नहीं होता है उसको रिफॉर्म करने का तो अब वो अगर वो सिस्टम बिल्कुल ही खत्म कर दिया है टू मी इट डजंट मैटर आप फॉरेस्ट क्लीयरेंसेस ऐसे दे रहे हैं जैसे आप भिंडी भिंडी बेचने जा रहे हैं दुकान में तो यू नो इन ऑल दैट व्हाट इज द इंटीग्रिटी ड्यूरिंग गवर्नेंस यू नो व्हाट गवर्नेंस सिस्टम्स आर अबाउट द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग्स टू गवर्नेंस सिस्टम्स इज इन इंटीग्रिटी ऑफ द सिस्टम of, of its scrutiny, of its ability to, be, to have monitoring. All those systems have been destroyed. So I think there's a long way to go. And the most important challenge for India, in my view, is the institutional rebuildings that are needed. Public institutions have been completely wrecked and we cannot protect environment without it. So I think these are the things that, you know, you have all the respect and experience. If you would stand behind some of these ideas, give your heft to them. I think, you know, we can all do what we can do. I don't know kya hoga, magar, I mean, hamara kaam hai karte rehna. <laughs> um, good morning, ma'am. Uh, can I take a question to you? Yes, of course. Yes. Please. Uh, Ma'am, I'm Professor Ripunja Singh. I don't know if you remember you had visited my institute at CM Ripa Jaipur yes. on a water, water workshop. And yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my question is actually related to three important things of Rajasthan. One is the Aravlis, which are degrading and 50% of it has already been de degraded. And its impact will be felt in Haryana and uh, Delhi very soon due to the sand migration, which is taking place. And the second point will be the number of environmental cases is more than 6,000 uh, in Rajasthan for uh, the all cases related to environment degradation and mining, illegal mining, other in Aravlis and surrounding areas. And the third point is on the interlinkages of river, which can be boon to Rajasthan. I'd like to have a few of your comments on these things, ma'am. Thank you. See, very clearly, Aravlis is critical. But Aravlis ka future kya hai, ye kabhi socha hai humne. Amari kya, hum Aravlis se chate kya hai, the world's oldest mountain range, amazing. I mean, hamara institute is at the base of the Aravlis. Incredible. What beauty. Okay. What do we want from the Aravlis? Today, the only thing that the Aravlis are giving us is stones for crushing. We have a stone crusher right next to a, uh, our own institute. And in spite of me and all my noise and everything, I can't do anything. Okay? And the guy in front of my in front of my eyes, and we had the chief minister there, we had everyone. So everyone keeps coming to our institute. Illegal mining. We need to think about these things. I mean, and I am now put my colleagues on the job and I said, give me an answer to stone crushing. We need stones. We need crushed stones. Okay. But what is the way ahead? How do you manage the, the regulation around stone crushers and the legal illegal mining? But then there's another issue about what is the future of the Arablis? What is it that we can, we as a country and as a state, Rajasthan, 
What is it that you're benefiting from the Aravlis? We need to understand the, increase, the enormous role of Aravlis in terms of the watershed of the Aravlis. We have not been able to understand and put a value to it. So the only value we see is kato or toro. So I think it's a lot to do with a lot of this. As far as interlinking is concerned, I'm giving you very short answers because these questions are can take me a whole day to answer. Interlinking is concerned. I'm not sure if Rajasthan will benefit from interlinking. I'm not against interlinking. Interlinking has been done from a, for, for centuries. You interlink a river, you interlink a stream, you take water from one to the other. The problem today is that all streams do not have less water. So you cannot, other than the Brahmaputra, which has more water, all rivers of India have water only in the time of floods. And to be able to convey water from one flooded river to another flooded river requires you to have huge engineering so that you can actually displace the water before you can transport it. I think for Rajasthan, the most incredible work, and you have done incredible work, both in the past, I mean, CSC got its water prize in Stockholm because we took the Rajasthan experience of Jodhpur, of Jaisalmer, your ability to hold every drop of water. Jaisalmer was the world's largest trading route, yet no recorded history of any ever Jaisalmer running out of water because the ability of people to be able to live with water scarcity, to hold and treasure every drop of water. And I think that learning of being able to build the rebuild the tanks and ponds and maybe interlink the tanks and ponds as was done and is being done. I mean, in our campus, when you come, you will see we have the Arablis at the back. We harvest every drop of water. We have to live on that water because we are also, we don't have a municipal water supply there. So we have physometers, we, we check on our groundwater level, we harvest our water, we, we, we protect, but look at the Aravlis at the back. If that entire region could become the watershed, look at the wealth that you're creating in the, the, the villages all around. So I think these are issues that I think is happening. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not coming to you and saying, kuch nahi ho ra aur ab kal kuch I'm not, uh, I'm not one of those. I believe a lot has happened over the last 10 years, huge investment has been made 20 years now in rebuilding the water systems, the traditional water systems, and investing in water conservation, soil conservation. Where we are going wrong is that we are not investing in village institutions that can manage these rural resource assets. That's the missing link. That's what we need to focus on. Thank you, ma'am. Can I, can I speak? Hello? Ah, what you only? Are you see? Ah, so I'm all right. What do you mean? Mute, unmute, Kariye. Aapka mic band hai. Hello? Ah, we so can now. We so can now. Ab, 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 Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I Hello. want to just recall a day. In Jaipur, you are here for the is it is it audible? Ah, you are you are in the Jaipur Literature Festival a few years ago. Yes. I met you for a few few minutes and I requested you for a Hindi down to earth. I have been a subscriber for 20 years and more of uh, your down to earth magazine and I write occasionally on climate change and uh, uh, and I get material also from your magazine. My wife is a botanist. We have been subscribing it for more than 25 years, I think. Of course, Hindi I'm not getting, but uh, all annual reports and everything. Hindi, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you. You told me that we started it, and then we started it. Hindi down to earth is very good. Yeah, we are very grateful to you for, for the comprehensive coverage. One, one question has been posed recently in a newspaper uh, article that is about uh, solar panel wastage. Uh -huh. I think that also should be looked into. In fact, I I have not been a pioneer, but I was the first among our colleagues to put a solar, solar panel uh, on our uh, rooftop. And we are getting 
uh, our uh, reduction in electricity charges and also uh, helping this come in a way. So I just wanted to thank you also for all that you have uh, given us coverage, very comprehensive, and we'll certainly take an opportunity to go to the Jara and see, uh, see the on the ground. Or N K Mathur from Delhi, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. We have just listened to an ex Hello? excellent, excellent presentation by Sunita Narayanji. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Much of the um, emphasis of Mr. Sharma rightly was on electricity transmission. My short answer to that would be, or suggestion to that would be, generate electricity where it is needed. And generation of electricity today has become comparatively easy due to renewable sources, especially the solar energy on which the Prime Minister has also emphasized much. The solar energy can be generated at the particular spots where it is needed, especially in the rural areas, which form 80% of India's geographical area. Thereby, we will obviate the need for long transmission lines. And transmission lines can continue to serve the urban areas wherever, where, where they are most needed. This is, this is one, one suggestion which- Very good. If, if it goes through your CSE, may go very far. No, thank, thank you. you. I think these are all very important ideas. Let's hope that they get acted upon. Very important. Yes, sir. Or koi agar nahi hai to Manavaj ji. Yes, sir. Aap dhanyavad de for an excellent presentation today. Yes, sir. Interesting discussion as well. Thank you, Sunita. It was a treat listening to you because uh, all most of us have been following you through your TV talks and your writings and various things. And uh, I've been following you for many, many years and whatever you have been doing and saying. And today's talk was a special privilege for us as we heard from you. So with such a clarity and with such an effectivity that uh, as somebody said that your talk has been a sustainable one for all of us. And I think wherever we go and wherever we talk, we will certainly disseminate whatever we have learned through this uh, today's uh, presentation. And I think it is, an, I would say it is an eye opener. I, we never thought in Rajasthan, Western Rajasthan, people used to think that if the rains come, I think they would always be welcome. And they thought that the drought is going to be over. But the term that you have mentioned that the flooding, flood in the drought uh, situation or that floods can also cause drought and the famine situation, uh, that it is really... Uh, very very new thing for us to learn. You have also mentioned that we keep on talking about the environment and development, and you said it is not a uh, environment versus development. It is a, a senseless uh, development which is creating the problem for the environment. So all of, let us begin after your talk, and uh, all those who have been uh, uh, maybe interacting with you would certainly take this idea forward that uh, we should stop doing senseless development and uh, bring more sense into our development projects. And it is so interdependent. The world has become so interdependent. You have so, so clearly brought out. I don't, want, I don't want to venture into trying to summarize uh, all these things that you have said. It has been a real privilege for us. And uh, thanks a lot for sparing time for this uh, Jigyasa Club and talking to us. Uh, and I hope we have more opportunities of uh, not only seeing the campus in Tijara, but also interacting with you as and when the uh, you would have uh, the time and with the conveniences there. So thanks a lot once again on behalf of all of us who have been listening to you and on behalf of the association, on my own behalf. Thank you very much, Sunita Ji. It has been a wonderful uh, time 
spend uh, listening to you and uh, we I, I, we were seeing more often uh, you in the, on the tv present tv talk these days uh, your writings are there I'm but avoiding you know, it <laughs> <laughs> so but, but uh, you, you, you you used to follow i think uh, quite a lot you know, whenever some any article of you appears in whenever when in wherever it appears at least i have always make it a point to keep a note of it and try to share with my friends in our groups wherever i go to talk to the students or the trainer i use some of these things that you have said thanks a lot and it was our pleasure but really thanks. great